Hey guys, how are we doing? Um, here, Dinny with another podcast had a, a bit of technical difficulty there, so Dinny's uh, <laughs> he's technically hosting this from uh, his end, but um, yeah, cool stuff. I, uh, Dinny's just back from a, a two month hiatus, and um, where were you, Dinny? I was out in uh, northern Spain surfing, yeah, lovely. It was um. You, you pulled me back to Facebook for a Facebook Live two weeks ago, and I'm, I'm pulling you back to work, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about time I, I got back and done something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, have you been keeping up with things? Like, what's going on? What's uh, madness? Yeah, keeping up with things. Not sort of getting engrossed in it, but just watching from afar and watching the whole place burn down and observing it. And just it's just peak clown world. Yeah, yeah. You, you can destroy billions of dollars of value and you're still sitting on the beach with your buddies and it just shows that when you buy politicians and uh, when you buy the media, there's different rules applied and apply to you or me. Like if I was to steal your money, I'd probably go to jail fairly quickly. Yeah, I know if you, if you stole nearly, you know, any money at all for like a normal person, but like, Jesus, like, did you see, um, just to, did you see that interview today uh, with the like was it New York Times or is like CNBC or something and they were all clapping like SBF after like just for coming onto the stage or whatever. I know, yeah, that's why I said peak clown world. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, and you have like um, you know, all the like Kevin O'Leary types kind of like saying that they, you know, they kind of they buy his story or whatever, which is just totally insane. Like, yeah, opt out. <laughs> that's what I don't know anyway. <laughs> yeah yeah so look i suppose the purpose of this podcast like we've, we've been talking um before this but just uh like a real kind of back to basics like this is a uh, kind of your bread and butter your every day you're kind of orange filling people you're bringing them into bitcoin making them understand like what money is what's the story with the whole thing investing all that good stuff um and yeah just this podcast is meant to be an introduction to Bitcoin. So, um, yeah. So, like, where do you want to start then? Do you want to just uh, give your background introduction, like your whole Bitcoin story, how you, how you got to where you are today? I'll give you a brief story. <laughs> 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 I was poor. Life was hard. I never understood money for the first half of my life. I worked my ass off. And I still wasn't getting ahead. Then I started to figure out, okay, well, I read a lot of books on how to get rich and, there seems to be a, resound, a resounding team, and that was unless you learn to invest, you're never going to be able to exit this rat, rat race or opt out. And my dream was to opt out and just go surfing and, you know, win the money game, not for the sake of having loads of money, just but having the choices and the freedom. So then I engrossed myself in learning how to invest, and I invested heavily into myself initially. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built businesses. I built a successful fitness business. Um, and, uh, and I just went down the rabbit hole of learning to invest, and of course, that brought me into starting to understand money a little bit deeper. And that was really when I had the aha moment of no wonder I found it so difficult. I've been exchanging my time for something that's constantly going to be worth less in the future. It's like, I'm trying to fill a bucket full of water and financial freedom is when the bucket's full, but the bucket's got a massive hole in it. And no one has told me or explained the rules of the game to me. And that's why it's so difficult. So once I learned how to plug the hole, uh, it became a lot easier to get ahead. And that inevitably led me down the, the route of, uh, of money and what money is. And, and then I fell into gold. And before being a Bitcoiner, I was actually, you know, I would have dollar cost average into gold and being a gold investor just to have some sort of a money that's outside of the system that doesn't have any counterparty risk. And then inevitably, of course, you're going to have exposure to Bitcoin because it does everything gold does and it just does it a hundred times better. And that sort of was my own onboarding into, into Bitcoin. And then I've just been falling down the rabbit hole. And the more you learn, the more you realize there's more to learn. Uh, so it's just a really interesting space to be in. Yeah. And just like, I, like, obviously, I know you quite well or reasonably well anyway. So I'm aware of your story. But like the whole thing, um, like you broke your back, like, and kind of picked yourself up and then established a fitness business. Like, what's the story with that? Cause I don't think I ever actually asked you on it directly. Yeah, so I suppose uh, I'm really passionate about exercise and fitness. If you follow me on any of the social medias, you'll see that every day. It's I do my daily exercise, something. Uh, it's one of the best parts of my day. But but when you break your back and you lie in a hospital bed and you stare at the ceiling and everything that you took for granted is now gone, um, when you're fortunate enough, or if you're fortunate enough to get it back, you, 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 you have a, a new lease of life, a new outlook, a different perspective, a new appreciation or, or a gratitude. 
and uh, ultimately that, that an accident i'm into motorbikes i'm still into motorbikes very passionate about them but they come with consequences it's it's reality uh you know there's risk and then there's the consequences of taking risk but um the 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 my back injury led me down fitness because i had to rehab myself uh fr from lying in a hospital bed barely able to limp around and um and then i was like after i'd rehabbed myself over three years, I was like, well, I feel great. Fair enough, I look, I've more muscle and I'm skinny and people say, geez, didn't you look great? But to me, it was the changes that happened inside. I had more energy, I had more motivation, I had more self-belief, I had much more confidence than I ever had in my life. And these are all just byproducts of becoming super fit and healthy. And I was like, geez, this is great crack. Maybe I'll just teach other people how to do this. Try the broken back. I can easily teach a lad how to lose a few pounds. That's easy. Uh, and that's where I spent, you know, the guts of 15 years of my life running fitness business and, and teaching people uh, how to lose weight and how to become passionate about exercise and uh, and uh, exercise is, is sort of like money in that most of the things that people think is, is the correct thing to do it's actually a lot of bullshit and it's the wrong thing to do and that's why most people in the western world are overweight because the information isn't accurate and uh, although they put in the effort and they work hard at losing weight they're very rarely successful because a lot of the information is just skewed and it's not very accurate and the things that I do would be or the train the way I train would be very difficult to the way most 40 year olds would, would train um so it was all about just trying to communicate that there's a better way we can be more efficient with this and of course that combined with my passion for it because I love doing it um it, it was a great way to spend a decade of my life yeah and so like did you so just getting back in a couple of years you spent getting back on your feet from the whole thing did you like were you following kind of conventional advice or did you just take it into your own hands and figure it out yourself kind of thing or was it a bit of both um it, it was a bit of both initially i didn't want to take responsibility that was one of the biggest lessons that the accident uh taught me i was like surgeons fix me go on there get in there operate <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then i was two operations in and and nearly a year and I wasn't any better. I still couldn't fucking walk properly. I was still in tremendous amount of pain and living on really strong painkillers. And uh, so then I decided, right, well, Dean, it's your fault. You, you fucking broke your back. Get involved. So I started, you know, this was before smartphones and that. I used to take myself to the library um, on a little push scooter because I couldn't walk. <laughs> yeah, well, I could roll. And uh, I used to take myself to the library and get out books on the anatomy and pain and rehab and core and Pilates and yoga and just started educating myself. And then when I got a little bit better, you know, uh, I started to, uh, I, I done a, you know, personal training certificate course. And then I became a physical therapist, not because I wanted to massage people. I just wanted to learn more and more and more about the human body for my own self-interest to rehab myself. And that journey went from hospital bed, broken back to after three years, um, I finished an Ironman triathlon. Ironman triathlon is probably one of the most sing difficult single day endurance events that a human can do. It, 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 it's like a four kilometer swim, a bike ride like from Dublin to Galway, and then you run a full marathon as soon as you get off the bike and it's all going as fast as you can go. So it's a good 10 hours of nonstop exercise. So that is one of the features of compounding, just a little bit done consistently layered on top of each other. And it's one of the investment principles that I've used for you know, to free myself financially, but it's so important that it, you can compound anything, compound your wealth, your knowledge, your health, your strength, uh, everything can be compounded. And uh, and that was my journey sort of from hospital bed to becoming super fit. Yeah, so geez, yeah, triathlons, do you still do that? No, I haven't done triathlon in oh, probably eight years. I used to do one a year. My, 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 my sort of, I have reasoning, I have a, I have a plan, so uh, in, in the Ironman triathlons, you can go to the world championships, which are in Hawaii. Now it's super competitive and I don't have natural genetics or anything. So I'm never going to come in the top two in an Ironman race to qualify. However, in the over 70s age group, there's maybe one or two competitors. So I think if I give up for maybe a two or three decades and then I go back at it, then I qualify for Hawaii because meanwhile, everyone else has been slogging their body. They've worn out their knees, their hips their ankles, you know, their bodies are worn out from doing, <laughs> from doing all this endurance stuff. Whereas I'm going to keep my body fresh. I'm just going to do my gymnastics. I'm going to surf. And then please God, if I'm in my seventies, I'll show up to an Ironman triathlon. I'll, <laughs> I'll get myself over the line and uh, off to Hawaii I'll go <laughs> for the world championship. That's, that's gas. God. Um, yeah. So, and just, just one last question, Trey. So I've actually been, I've watched, I watched an Ironman recently. There was one in England there. Um, I expect they're on everywhere the whole time. But uh, 
how long do you should you train for something like that is it like three months six months a year or could you do it like 10 weeks or that mental talk yeah like it depends how fast you want to do it if someone put a gun to your head right now you do an iron man you know you it might take you two days but you do it <laughs> so, so it depends. everyone be gone home <laughs> yeah it, it does the thing with with that sort of training it, it, it's really good because it teaches you life lessons like iron man is all about suffering it's learning to deal with pain because it doesn't matter how fit you are it hurts it hurts like hell you're going as fast as you can and it doesn't matter what your level is or what your time is that's your perspective that's your genetics that's whatever but um you know it teaches you that to to, to get uncomfortable it teaches you about discipline an iron man typical training camp if i was doing an iron man i'd probably set myself a year because i haven't been consistently training if you're doing one a year well you can probably get yourself in peak shape for it in three months but uh it all depends on it and it's different and i suppose in your first triathlon you wouldn't do an iron man or you know there's shorter distance ones you can do a sprint triathlon and you can they take about an hour and 10 minutes for or an hour for the fast guys to, to complete a sprint triathlon and that's a nice introduction into triathlon racing triathlon is an awesome sport and uh, it's really cool and it's something that i although i don't do it now it's something that i probably will always go back and and, and do an old track long because they are a good crack yeah that's super interesting i might join you we could uh get back into it together or something but wait i don't know about what waiting 25 years or something to be able to say. <laughs> <laughs> but um so you kind of so you had the accident with the bike um you kind of rehabilitated yourself you made a quite successful business from what I understand with your whole fitness business um so like am I correct in saying you kind of learn how to make money and then you because it's not the same thing like learn to make money and to kind of invest money and manage money is they're totally two different things like people in business will often tell you that like you know for years they made a load of money and they just kept losing it all the time and you know uh not good financial habits that kind of thing so we're correct in saying you learn how to make money kind of the whole abundance mindset all that kind of stuff and then the investing kind of came later yeah initially i sort of pulled it all together because i was investing i just wasn't investing into external assets i was building myself as an asset so i i learned how to invest into myself and i learned early in my in my business journey that if if I rather than just keep all my money and whatever profits I get in my business, just keep them in the bank or spend them. Uh, if I reinvest back into the business and back into myself being, you know, primarily I was the business. It was Dini Collins Fitness was the name of the company. So the more I reinvested into my own education, the bigger my returns. And that was, I suppose, my gateway into understanding. Well, this this is what investing is. Investing isn't just external assets. Investing is the number one investment anyone can make is into themselves as an asset, into their education, because there's no difference between us all humans. We all have brains. We all have two arms, two legs. You know, it, most of us do if we're lucky. The only difference is what's in our head, the education that we have. So investing into yourself is the best investment the, that you can make. And then it's quite easy to transition into investing into external assets because you understand the journey and you understand them um, you know for me when i started to invest into other asset classes i already understood that if i invest into education before just trying to do it the cheap way and figure it out myself if i try to figure it out myself i have to spend my own time and i have to spend my own money on mistakes so you have to spend either way but if i invest into education i have to spend money but i spend less time and time is the asset so I can try and figure something out over 10 years and then I'm good at it. Or I can pay someone who spent 10 years figuring it out and who's good at it. And they might teach me over a weekend what it might take me 10 years to learn through my mistakes, my time and my money. So I understood early on that, re that return on investment is the most important thing. And I'm not afraid to invest into myself. And I'm not afraid. And, and, and that gives you, it gives you, you know, experience and an understanding that I think transfers over really, really well into when you're actually investing into we'll say assets which are separate than you the asset when when you, when you the asset are have a better base and a better education um it, it helps your understanding to be able to to be able to manage risk and all the typical things an investor needs to do yeah and sure look it's exact so like when you talk about um you know compounding like you mentioned earlier on yourself like you know you went from broken back and then before you knew it you're doing triathlons like um it's exactly the same kind of thing with investing like but um 
so like say investing people who you know just you're kind of everyday person or maybe you have money maybe you don't have money but you want to learn about investing like where do you even like where do you even start with that how do you how do you manage your own money the the place that i direct people to start um is robert kiyosaki's book rich dad bird dad and the reason for that is you want to give something that's easy you don't want to give them a, a book full of jargon that you're gonna to have to google words every paragraph because i've done all that and it's not exciting but robert kiyosaki's book is written for the average person who's no clue about how to invest who thinks like a poor person and it just shows them how a rich person thinks and the difference and it's just done in story format so it's super easy to learn and there's not many people i've recommended that book to who hasn't said dinny you know what that book's got me thinking some changes are happening and it just causes them to start changing so i'd always direct people to that uh, rich dad poor dad and it was a book i've read i've read it geez i don't know at least three times now maybe four um rich dad poor dad but robert kiyosaki yeah that's an absolutely amazing book um i think nearly everyone that reads that is kind of like uh you know uh, what do you call it like uh, a what changed forever yeah, I know. Like, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I just can't think of the, <laughs> the word like a paradigm shift. That's the word yeah. after. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, like with regards to investing then. So like what I, I know a big theme of that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he's like it was written in the what the 90s, was it like? Um, And he's talking about he's even highlighting the fact that about money. So like what is money? Um, He talks about gold and silver. So he kind of had the whole business he had his business go and generate lots of money um and then he was basically saying don't save in cash so he's saying I suppose the question to you is why is he saying do not save in cash and what do you do if like cash in the bank is a bad idea so like what's what's money I suppose is the question there's a few questions there <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah no no the, the question actually wasn't what's money <laughs> that was like totally different after but like, yeah, why? Where where do you want to start then? Well, it's money, or why why not? Well, why I, the bank is a bad idea. Yeah, well, I'll start with with with, with why invest, because if you don't invest, you're screwed. The thing is, we've been we've been we we've been fed mistruths. It's like work your job, save your money, put it in the bank, you'll get ahead. You're guaranteed not to get ahead if you do that. That's me at the tap trying to fill the bucket full of water, and it's draining out of the big hole. Okay, so you have to invest. With the inflation levels we're experiencing right now, you're losing half your wealth every 10 years. Okay, so that means if you have, if you have 10 grand in savings in the bank right now, you're obliged just by math to take five grand out and do something with it. Spend it, get rid of it, buy lotto tickets, invest it into something. It doesn't matter the risk because it's gone anyway. You've lost five grand in personal power. Okay. So therefore, you, it's to get over this thing that investing is risky. Not investing is the riskiest thing that a person can do. If you don't invest, it's going to be very hard for you to get ahead. You can't earn your way to financial freedom. I've experienced clients um, through, through my Bitcoin consulting company, Bitcoin McDinney, and through my fitness company, you know, and they're on six-figure salaries, but they're nowhere near early retirement. They're the same as the person who's on a minimum wage job. They're a phone call away from bankruptcy. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much you earn. That's not going to give you financial freedom because we can only work 40 hours a week. When I was a busy entrepreneur, sometimes I'd work 100 hours a week. But I'd get tired and cranky after a few years of doing that. And I didn't. I was only doing it because I knew I could exit if, I, if, I were, if I'd done three years of work every year, well, I could get myself ahead faster. But my money works 168 hours a week every week and it never complains and it never gets tired so this is the beauty of investing it's all about leverage it's all instead of you doing the work get your money to do the work and this is why investing is key investing is critical investing isn't risky not investing is risky and when you want to start investing the time to start investing for anyone who hears this is now today people often make the mistake they're going i'm going to save up this money and then i'm going to become an investor that's a really foolish thing to do because what are you going to do? You're going to save up, get five grand, 10 grand, 50 grand, whatever the figure, it doesn't matter. Then you're going to come out into the investment world, the markets, and the markets will punish it. That's what markets do. They move money from the uneducated to the educated or from the impatient to the patient. The time to start investing is now. 
and build a little portfolio so that you're investing with smaller pools of capital and use that to make your mistakes. So the time you're actually in time, you'll compound your information, your education, and then you'll be managing a larger pool of money, but you'll have the experience to be able to manage it. Um, so the time to start investing is, uh, is always now, I think, and not just investing your money, but investing into your education. That's where your biggest return is going to be. Yeah, so like you mentioned there, the leak in the bucket. So you're, you're, you know, if you don't invest, you're beholden to inflation. Where after five years, um, or after ten years, you do, you lose half your money. And like the rate of this seems to be going up. So like if if you think of like every time you you drive past the you know the petrol station, the prices are up again. And compare that to you know twenty years ago, they're like more than double. Um, and then if 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 you apply that to even things like property, like house prices in Dublin, twenty twenty five years ago. Like I couldn't even tell you how many times higher. Like you're from Dublin, what what they be like five, ten times higher than they would have been twenty years ago? Uh, twenty years ago, I haven't a clue. I know my dad paid twenty thousand for his house. What year was that? Seventies, and I know oh he probably worked seven hundred thousand. Yeah, so that's <laughs> like <what? laughs> you're not not that it's a fancy house. It's on a nice location. It's got a sea view, but just in that the money has lost its value so much. Yeah, so it's like, uh, what's that, like a uh, 30 times price, 34 times, 33, 34 times price increase. Um, so like, well, how would you explain, why is this happening? Like, if, I suppose it's a very complex subject, but if, if it's able to be distilled down simply, like why is inflation a thing? Uh, inflation is a thing because our money is backed by nothing and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's just like my dad said to me when i was a kid it's a good answer he, he had a he had, he had toilet roll in his hand and he says what's the difference between this and like there was like maybe a 20 pound on the table and i was like well that's toilet roll and that's that's money and, and, and it's like yeah what's the difference and i was like well, well that's worth something fighting at the the money and the toilet roll is just toilet roll now I realize I had it so backwards because he then said to me, he says, nah, they're both the same, like they're just paper. But like there's more utility in the toilet roll than there is in the in the paper money. And, and I jokingly used that analogy. I'm like, toilet paper is probably better money than the euro. And, and people are like, Danny, what are you talking about? You're crazy. And I'm like, all right, well, five years ago, was toilet paper uh, cheaper or more expensive? It was cheaper. Okay, and in five years time, is, is it going to take more euros to buy the toilet paper than it takes today? Yes. So toilet paper is storing value better than the actual money, the thing you're saving and accumulating. So what you do is you go to the bank, you withdraw all your money, you buy a lot of toilet rolls, you put them in a warehouse, you leave them there for 20 years, and you'll be richer than if you leave money in the bank. <laughs> it's a stupid analogy, but it's like you can't argue that it's probably true. <laughs> yeah. Um... And so money's backed by nothing. So, like, is this sustainable? Is inflation going to keep getting worse? Um, yeah, well, I suppose a better question would be, so backed by money, pivot into Bitcoin then. Bitcoin's your, like, your Bitcoin with Dini. You know a lot about Bitcoin. I'm obviously involved in the space again. Why is Bitcoin a different kind of money to the kind that's backed by nothing that's inflating away every year due to excess money printing or whatnot. Bitcoin is a better money because it's it, it it's it's going back to almost like gold. It's a, it's an innovation on gold, although it's much bigger than that. As a as a simple explanation is, it's an innovation on gold. Gold is backed by energy, in that it takes energy to create gold. It takes energy to mine gold, and dig it up out of the ground. It takes diesel and manpower, and and it's scarce. And Bitcoin is the very same in that it takes energy to create Bitcoin. It takes electricity. It takes natural resources to actually create Bitcoin. So unlike a, a euro or a 50 euro note, which can be just printed like or, or created uh, on a computer, a Bitcoin can't just be created on a computer. It's got to be mined. It's got to go through the process of mining. And, 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 and that's what allows it to have value. It's the scarcity of something is where the value is. Euros are abundant and we can print them easily and for nothing but nobody can print bitcoin easily and for nothing there's a cost to it just like there's a cost to gold and and that's why bitcoin is much scarcer 
than the euro and that's what's allowing it to increase its purchasing power when priced in euros not daily not monthly not even yearly but when you look at it over five or ten years we can see that bitcoin in purchasing power terms is going up and the euro in purchasing power terms over five to ten years is only going down and that you have to give more of your euros to buy goods and services but i have to give less of my bitcoin to buy goods and services so for me my cost of living is getting more expensive in the euros because i, I use sort of two money systems i use euros for day-to-day -day living and expenses and i use bitcoin for longer term savings but my cost of living in the euro is becoming more expensive my cost of living in bitcoin denominated terms is becoming cheaper over time yeah so i suppose it's like when when you weigh them up it's like you have the characteristics of money whatnot but i suppose the, the main one is the scarcity aspect so like that's what makes money you know if you think of if everyone was going around and driving Lamborghinis or something like no one would really want them because it wouldn't be a status symbol anymore. But like if you take Bitcoin, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. And then you have the euro, which there's infinitely more created every year because we're in a debt based system. There has to be more created or else the whole thing collapses like the government never balances books. There needs to be more money. That's very maybe oversimplistic way of putting it but the money supply keeps getting expanded. So when you're using a money with its supply that's constantly expanded versus Bitcoin, which is fixed in supply, um, it's kind of like the rational economic actor chooses to store their money in Bitcoin, even though it's it's like, you know, way, way more volatile or whatever. Um, would, like, would you agree with that kind of? Yeah. The, the volatility is your friend though. If there's no volatility, um, you're losing to inflation. So it's like the, 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 the price discovery that, that Bitcoin's on, it's just constantly getting repriced and the short-term thinkers involved and there's people using leverage uh, and there's just all this noise. And then there's people like us who just understand the technology, understand the scarcity element and every human on the planet is ser searching for scarcity. We need food, we need shelter. And then once we became civilized, we started searching for scarcity because that's where we can store value for the future. So that's why we buy pensions. That's why we buy the stock market. That's why I used to dollar cost average into gold. That's why we build companies or invest into companies. So we're all looking for scarcity because that's how we protect our value. Now, when I was a poor person, I didn't understand this. That's why I used to not do that. And I used to save money. I used to save euros. But then I understood the game from reading Robert Kiyosaki and many, many other books and trainings. That, that no, you don't save in something that's abundant. You look for scarce things. And Bitcoin is digital scarcity. And it's, it's almost perfect scarcity because it's improved on the characteristic of, of scarcity. Um, gold is scarce, but we can always mine more gold and we'll only get more efficient at mining it. So it means there's always going to be a supply of gold coming to the market. But Bitcoin is finite, which is an improvement on scarcity in that there's only a set capped amount of, of Bitcoin. And that really is interesting. And the stumbling block people have is the short term price volatility because the number goes up and down, um, you know, on daily, weekly, monthly. But um, long term, it's the scarcest thing that we have. And just because it's digital, some people are afraid of it. But like without being ageist, those people will die. The people behind are all very comfortable with digital stuff. People will say Bitcoin's not. People will comment to me on Facebook and go, Bitcoin's not real. And I'm like, because you can't hold it in your hands. And I'm like, the platform that you're wasting your whole life on, Facebook, you can't hold it in your hand. It's an app on your phone and you're living there. Like, so your argument is possibly flawed. <laughs> yeah, and as well, like they probably have most, you know, they're saying Bitcoin is not real or whatever, but then they have, uh, they're looking at their bank account, which says their balance, which is just a digital like ledger telling them their balance. Like that's equally not real. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's that's a good analogy. So, like, look, around the volatility, um, I know, just to talk a little bit around that, like, a lot of people who don't understand the technology um, get absolutely sick to their stomach, uh, like, looking at Bitcoin's volatility, and they might buy in, and it's all rosy when it's going up, and then when it's going down, they start selling at a loss or pull money out, um, maybe because they don't understand it. The, the core technology, but they also don't understand why it has to be volatile at this early stage. Um, but see, so yeah, like how how would you explain why the volatility is a good thing at the moment? The volatility is, is part of it, and 
I suppose where we go wrong is naturally we're really bad investors. You know, we like to buy high and sell low. Obviously, that doesn't make sense when I say it, but, you know, it's easy to buy something when the price appreciating and we all want it. But like right now, today, as crypto markets are crashing and companies are falling apart and there's loads of contagion in our space, like this is a much better time to be being greedy than it was 12 months ago. But the amount of people who want to be greedy now, it's not the same. Like my courses were much busier in a bull run than they are in in this bear market. But the irony is because this isn't my first bear market, uh, but it was it was by investing through bear markets that I actually made, you know, you, you make money in a bull market, but you get really rich in a bear market. That's how I see it. But emotionally, we're, we're bad investors. So we'll choose to, to, you know, only want to invest at the wrong time. Basically, when we use our emotion, we'll do the wrong thing at the wrong time every time. And that's why part of what I sort of teach people to do is forget all that. We, want, we can't do this. Humans are bad investors. We need to create a strategy and we just stick to our strategy no matter what. And we think it is like an investor, like any of the investors in the world, uh, there are people who just use dollar cost averaging, who use comp the power of compounding. We talked about that with fitness uh, earlier, but they use, just use the power of investing, thinking in the long term. And many of them went through sickening volatility where their investments lost, you know, 80, 90 percent of their value. But because they were thinking this is a decade investment, this is a 20 year investment, this is a 30 year investment. They were immune to that fact. They weren't in the get rich quick mindset and how to protect yourself from that in Bitcoin terms or how I protect my, myself is I use a, a, a system just called dollar cost averaging that I just decide after all my living expenses are paid, I, 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 I spend less than I earn so that I have some savings, okay? But I understand that if I save it, I'm guaranteed to lose. So I've got to invest it. So I take a portion of that and I just invest it into Bitcoin. And every week I just buy my Bitcoin. It doesn't matter what the price is. I'm not interested in it because I've no intention of needing that money this week, this month, this year, even this decade, I don't need the money. You know, I'm, I'm living below my means. I'm fortunate. I have uh, businesses and I have incomes that I can live off and I can get me anything I want to buy. And my investments is just money that I'm putting away. Maybe I'll never even need it in my lifetime. So it's a longer term time horizon. Like, see so your view of that is that's just savings you're putting away every week. You're not even thinking about it. It's not really, it's, it's almost not even a conscious decision. So you can't be kind of beholden to your emotions to go wrong somehow. No, yeah, it's a risk managed approach. It's like, I'm happy to allocate this portion of my capital into Bitcoin. I don't see a better place for it as a long-term savings vehicle. And uh, like my bet is, the world's going to figure this out one by one, person by person. People are going to figure this out. And like all technologies, the early adopters will be the ones who are rewarded um, th the most. And, and the volatility is just to be expected. And I think us as Bitcoiners, you have to get used to that. Like you have to get used to you're going to buy this thing and it's going to go down. But you see, you're thinking in fiat terms, in Bitcoin terms. Because th that's how I think with my Bitcoin portion. I just think every month I'll have more Bitcoin. I'll have more Bitcoin. I'm only thinking in Bitcoin denominated terms. I'm like, I have more of that 21 million fixed supply, that scarcest thing on the planet. And every human is looking for scarcity. And I'm fortunate enough that I managed to understand this before most of the planet. I'm going to keep accumulating as much of this as I can. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, it makes sense. Obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, so like say Bitcoin. So like, yeah, so when you're talking to your clients and stuff like do you like is it just bitcoin or would you say or would people like i suppose what's your view on like stocks and property and stuff like that um would you say like dca into other things or just bitcoin or yeah what's your take my, my take on it is i suppose i'll stay in my lane i don't i don't profess to be an expert on on any of those other asset classes. Me personally, I'm invested in them. Yes, I have exposure to property, to stocks, to precious metals. Um, but do I see them as having as good a return as Bitcoin? Not a chance, not over the next 30 years. Uh, I don't see them coming near to Bitcoin. And that's the beauty of it is that on a risk return basis, like if you want to get into property in Dublin, you need to take out leverage for half a million to get exposure to it. That's a lot of risk. Who knows what's around the corner? 
you want to get into a Bitcoin retirement plan, you need to take out 50 euros, baby, and maybe just another 50 euros next month. And now your dollar cost av averaging into a Bitcoin. So on a risk return basis, it's just like, this is a no brainer, like compared to the leverage you need for other asset classes to see a return. Yeah, so like, say, yeah, like you, meant, you mentioned there a minute ago that you're much more bullish on Bitcoin than other asset classes. Why, or I suppose not why is that, but like, what do you, like, I suppose, what do you think Bitcoin's growth potential, like talking numbers or whatever, but like, do you think Bitcoin has much left to run? Um, well, well, you, you obviously do, but is it drastically more than other things? Yeah, like Bitcoin's binary, I think. It becomes global money and everything is priced in it. I don't know, does that take 500 years, 200 years, 100 years, 50 years, 20 years? I don't know, but it's pretty binary. Like once you understand Bitcoin, it's hard to see it only becoming this much of global money. It's like, why though? Because it's ultimately exponentially harder than any other source of money there is. So that's its end game. So if it's global money, obviously, there's a little bit more to run in it. Like, I don't know what the valuation of all global money divided by 21 million is, but it's exponentially higher. When, when, you, when, I, when I put it to other asset classes, um, and I'll just give you an example, because some of the clients I consult with come to me and they're like, Dinny, I've an I've investment property there. I'm putting 200 quid in my pocket a month. I'm getting phone calls in the middle of the night. The neighbors aren't getting on with the other neighbors. It's a load of hassle. I have to put a grand into it now to get it painted, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm selling the thing, I'm out. And it just makes sense. It's like, you see, you have this physical asset that you have to put all the energy into, you have to maintain, okay? You have to put your energy into it, or you can just swap it for this digital asset that isn't concreted into the ground in Ireland where you're stuck on whatever the local council laws are. And they're only becoming uh, more hostile to investors because of the monetary premium on property. So investors are being punished, stop buying up the houses, people can't afford them, okay? So you can transfer it into the digital asset, you can take it anywhere in the world with you. You wanna go live in Portugal, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax, put your Bitcoin in your pocket. You can't do that with your investment property. So it just makes rational sense for rational thinking people once they understand it. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. So I don't have to do anything Bitcoin. No, all you have to do is keep it safe and let the world make it more valuable. You don't have to put any energy into it. So I'm seeing, I'm personally seeing a capital flight from physical property into digital property, Bitcoin. Yeah, and I suppose like if, if you look at the numbers, it's like, what's the Bitcoin's probably worth about half, uh, what, half a trillion dollars in total, like value of all the Bitcoins in dollar terms out there. So total markups, but half a trillion. And then you look at like, like I think the figure for all the money out there is like 100. US stuff. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's over. Is it what is it hundreds or over hundred? It's nine hundred trillion. Okay, so like that's yeah. So if if all that, so just like I suppose to give perspective, everyone thinking about Bitcoin now, um, they think it's kind of a almost a big deal because they hear about it in the news a bit and you know it going up and going down, what whatever. But like all the value of all the euros, the dollars, the pounds, the yen, whatever, um, all over the world is like hundreds and hundreds of trillions of dollars and Bitcoin's only worth half a trillion dollar as a money. So like, it's so in its like infancy. It, I suppose you could, you could equate it to like people had maybe heard about Amazon back in 2002 or something, or like, you know, Facebook in 2005, but they didn't really, you know, didn't really know too much about her but they it was, i think it was kind of well known then you'd be able to speak for this better than i can um but then it just came one day it was just everyone was using it and that's kind of the exponential nature of bitcoin like i think it is binary because like when you understand bitcoin i don't think anyone ever really goes back or to do any experience of anyone going back like understanding bitcoin and then going back to want to save in the bank because like when, when you get the fact that your money's leaking with the bucket, the hole in the bucket one side, and it's fixed in supply the other side. Everyone's playing by the same rules. It's just everyone goes one way, and then it's kind of like what you said. You're just waiting for everyone to come then. Yeah, it's not a case that you have to ditch the euro and go 100% Bitcoin. I don't think. You, you know, to me that doesn't make sense. You need to have some euro savings. Although you're saving something that's gone down in value, but it's just called a 
it's just your emergency fund. It's your security book that I call it in, in the course that we do. And we all, you know, I advise to have a security book and have, and we know it's a depreciating asset we're holding, but it just means because it, it's liquid and it's, a, it's relatively stable compared to Bitcoin. You, you, you got to separate your investments from your living expenses. And, and sometimes that's where I think some Bitcoiners get it wrong is they pull it all together and then you can be punished because now you have to spend your Bitcoin at the wrong times when, the, when we go through these market downturns. So it's nice to separate the two. And that's why I live on a dual standard. You know, I have my living expenses, my security bucket, and then I have my long-term savings. Long-term savings mean, mean if the clutch goes in my car, I don't need to dip into my long-term savings. That's, that's in my living expenses. That's accounted in the security bucket for unexpected ex expenses that, that, that pop up. So I, I, I just sort of, I don't think you need to choose to be all in either side. And uh, with your question of do people go back? For me, what I've experienced with Bitcoin personally, you might relate to it as well, but I know all my clients in a retire early club, you know, Bitcoin is hope. It actually, when, when, when you don't understand Bitcoin and you see everything that's going on in the world and how the world is trending, it seems hopeless. It seems like, oh my God, this world is just like getting harder and harder to get ahead in. Like, but then once you understand Bitcoin and learn about it, it gives you hope. Okay, and all people have is their present moment. How do you feel right now? No one knows if I'll, I don't know if I'll be allowed to see Bitcoin see 100 grand. I'm pretty certain it's going to be 100 grand. Then it'll be a million, then whatever. But I don't know if I'll be allowed. But I know that for me being involved in Bitcoin today, now, I feel good. I feel better than if I wasn't involved in Bitcoin. It gives me hope for the future. It lets me see that there's an alternative financial system that seems to me, in my eyes, of treating everyone a little bit more equally as opposed to the system we have now it just seems to be centralizing the power centralizing the wealth that you know the poor middle class are getting bled and the top one percent are just accumulating more and more of the world's assets more and more of the world's wealth and it's hard to see that changing if we didn't have bitcoin but bitcoin is literally turning that on its head now yeah yeah and it, yeah 100 percent. i think it's like when you i suppose yeah like when you realize that the money it's like what ray dalio says the famous investor you know cash is trash so like basically saying that you should never really have significant amounts of cash in the bank now i know they kind of trade things and stuff so they would have some cash for crashes and to buy cheap and all of that but like again they're professional investors not recommended for like the <laughs> the ordinary person um but it's just that mentality like it's like when you understand that cash is trash it's like, well, what do you deal with it then? And it's just like Bitcoin, to me anyway, is the obvious alternative. So, yeah. Um, or look, as you said, you don't have to go 100%, like for everyone. Um, and, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin community kind of say, well, why would you do anything else? But like for someone that's much older, I'd kind of be thinking like, you know, don't do that um because there's no such thing as a sure thing and like you know property and all that is still going to appreciate because of the effects of the money printing um so yeah i i think you kind of share similar thoughts there do you yeah um diversification is important you see it depends where you are when i was i started my financial journey living in a caravan i had no money in my bank account and was just recovering from a broken back I was in a position where I could take a lot of risk. What had I got to lose? Now in the position I'm in, I don't take as much risk because it, it's not justified. There's no reason for me to take super high risk. Uh, so I would diversify more and cover myself more because as an investor, when you're trying to start your journey, you can take big swings and take big bets. And I done that to get ahead initially because I had nothing to lose. But then as you move up, I call it the financial ladder. As you move up the financial ladder, you know, the steps don't really make much of a difference in your life of, of, of the next rung, but what really make a difference if you go down to. So that's why when you have success, you have more wealth, or you're a little bit older in life, that you don't have the energy or the time to, you know, recoup mistakes. I, I think it makes sense to diversify uh, into other asset classes, although they might be inferior. The beauty about Bitcoin is it's so asymmetric that you probably don't need to be a hundred percent all in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like Bitcoin then, um, a lot of people talk about uh, Bitcoin and crypto, the, the wider crypto space. So, you know, a lot of the stuff you, so like, well, Bitcoin has crashed in recent months. 
crypto has gone down like so much harder as a general asset class outside of Bitcoin. So you have Bitcoin, then you have all the rest of the other crypto assets. Do you differentiate between Bitcoin and crypto or is this, yeah, is, is it not the same? Is it the same thing, I suppose? Um, no, it's definitely not the same thing. And that, that takes a while to, to figure that out. How, how I understand it now is Bitcoin was created to protect people from money printer. Every time money is printed, uh, it devalues all the money that I exchange all my time for. You know, that's why my, my granddad's wage, whatever, five euros a week, that's worthless in today's terms. Who the hell would work a week for a fiver? So his time was basically all diluted. And that's just how the fiat system works. Um, so Bitcoin was created to protect people from money printer, okay? And this is a vast generalization of, of crypto, okay? Because I know it's not all bad actors. People are trying to do good. Not everyone is evil in crypto. But what crypto did was it basically gave everybody the ability to be a money printer. And then anyone can spin up a token and, and you can go to a company and they'll wash trade it forward and back and retail will see the price of it and exchanges will take note and go, okay, we'll list that thing. And then they're dumping it on retail. So basically Bitcoin protected people from the money printer. And what crypto seems to have done is allowed anyone to become a money printer. So they're so different. And I was at a talk last night and there was an academic there from Trinity. And it just, it made me feel how early we are because he seemed to be teaching a course on blockchain, but he couldn't differentiate the difference between how it was just like, oh, well, Bitcoin's popular now, but something else might be popular in the future. And it was like, you're, you're not getting this. Like Bitcoin was ethically created. There was no pre-mine. Any Bitcoins that were created were created through mining. Energy was burnt to create those Bitcoins. That's not true with, with crypto. These things are spun up for free. They're spun up out of fresh air. It's basically a money printer. Uh, so there, there's, there's such a, a distinction between the two. And, uh, and one of my other questions was, uh, it was an exchange that was holding the event. And I said, is there a, <laughs> I says, uh, like, there's an onus to separate the two. But I says, but it probably doesn't go against the business model because the money is made by retail people buying altcoins and trading them. There's no, there's much less money being made by Bitcoin only companies where they're just educating people how to stack sats. There's nowhere near the profit margins it, as in allowing retail people to trade altcoins. So, you know, I suppose there's a lot of, there's a lot of carnage has to happen in our space until this all gets worked out. But just like the crash that we've seen now, a lot of people have been hurt really badly and a lot of people are learning really hard lessons. And now there's going to be hardcore Bitcoiners formed. And every time we go through these crashes and we'll have another bull run and another crash and another group of people who get really hurt. But every time we build a base of Bitcoiners, the base of Bitcoiners who've either learned hard lessons, this cycle, the last cycle, the cycle before, it's just getting bigger and bigger, and bigger. Because right now, the amount of wallet addresses holding one Bitcoin is at an all time high, which means that the amount of humans, individual actors who are choosing to go, now I know there's all this fraud and I know the European Central Bank are telling me Bitcoin's over, but I'm going to have one, okay? I don't trust you. I don't like your system. I, I want to hedge myself, okay? So the wallet address is holding one Bitcoin at an all-time high, 0.1 of a Bitcoin all-time high, 0.01 of a Bitcoin all-time high. So we're just building this base and it's it's becoming, the adoption has grown. And to me, that's all that's, in, it's all that's important to me is that adoption has grown. And, and you just sit back and let all the noise happen. Let companies come, let them implode, let them crash. And it doesn't matter to me. I just dollar cost average in and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it's a future bet rather than a present bet. And, and I expect the noise, I expect the carnage because the incentive is, the, the market incentive is, is crypto, trade, build exchanges, advertise them, get VCs, you know, and it's, that's just how the world works. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same, you know, in the dot-com boom with the 2000s when the internet was getting going, like you had all the, you know, loads of companies going bust kind of mad stuff and then you had amazon which is you know like the biggest company in the world or second biggest today um but so you're telling me like you're you're not concerned about uh christine lagarde from the ecb saying european central bank saying that uh bitcoin is is over now like um pack up your things like from the big crash does doesn't concern you a bit nothing that she says would concern me she said inflation came out of nowhere whereas me, an idiot pleb, sitting at home, 
in Dublin, Ireland, has been telling people since 2020, guys, you know, we're going to have a lot of inflation. We're printing a lot of money. I'm like, you know, clearly I don't have the education that these fucking academics should have, but like, how was I able to prepare and hedge myself so that inflation doesn't hurt me? But our talking heads and all were all asleep. So no, nothing that comes out of a politician's mouth would concern me. <laughs> it's a good answer. And like, so just, um, like, do you think that there's, uh, we, we could see like a digital euro, like a central bank digital currency come out of the ECB in the future to try and kind of maybe steal some of Bitcoin's thunder? Like what, what are your thoughts around that stuff? Yeah, a hundred percent. It, 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 it's, it's inevitable, predictable and guaranteed that we're going to have a digital euro. We have to, it's the only way the fiat system can survive. There's a battle on now. Bitcoin's adoption versus how quick they can launch the CBDC. But uh, that's a guarantee. We'll be in a cashless society. You know, I don't know when. Will it be five years? Will it be 10 years? Will it be 15? I don't think it's going to be 15. I think it's going to be sooner than that. But, you know, it, it's guaranteed that physical cash will be phased out uh, and we'll all be using the digital money, which will have no privacy. It'll have no fixed supply. You won't own the money and you won't be able to spend the money permissionlessly. So you'll have an option. While you can, you have an option to figure Bitcoin out because it's a money that you can own, you can spend permissionlessly, and it has a fixed supply. So the CBDC will be nothing like Bitcoin. It'll just be digital the same as Bitcoin. That'll be the only characteristic it'll share, but it'll be polar opposite in the actual characteristics of the money. Yeah, and like, look, for anyone that thinks like this is a conspiracy theory and it's unfounded or anything, just type in, you know, CBDC which means central bank digital currency, uh, CBDC digital euro on Google or CBDC US dollar. Um, and you'll see that they're busy working hard to try to figure out how they can get us with, um, basically it's a, a central bank controlled digital currency where that functions similar to Bitcoin, except that Bitcoin is decentralized and no one controls it. CBDC, they control it directly. So there's, there's not really any need for um all the kind of middlemen managing the money everywhere like the banks and the payment uh institutions and all that kind of thing so kind of thing they'd love in uh china <laughs> yeah and and, and, and like i push back on that and just say it's nothing like like bitcoin it's not similar to bitcoin the only thing it shares is that that that, that it's, it's it's digital like but really it's it's the polar opposite of what bitcoin is bitcoin is freedom that's slavery yeah exactly yeah no you're, you're totally right it's it's very very bad news um well, yeah, so... I'll, I'll just i'll just say this jack here's the bet who would you bet on the free market of entrepreneurs who are building and scaling bitcoin or a government you know when it comes to technology who's better at tech the free market or a government government have a horrendous reputation with technology you know so when it comes to the battle of are they going to be able to get this CBDC launched before Bitcoin's adoption has gone too far? You know, I'm not betting on a government and technology because generally they're they're not great with technology. Yeah, I know. And it's kind of like they're trying to hold back, like Bitcoin is borderless. It's uh, their, you know, global money. Um, like you see it in these Central American countries like El Salvador or whatever, they're starting to embrace Bitcoin. There'll be more coming very soon. And um if they're trying to kind of say that that's not happening, all the kind of wealth is just going to start leaking to places where Bitcoin is, you know, if, if, if they come in and they say Bitcoin's illegal here, like they have no way of enforcing it. And anyone that kind of understands Bitcoin, they're likely productive members of society. They understand how um, money works, how things work. They're just going to leave and then go to places where, you know, Bitcoin is respected and heralded. And it'd be like, the Soviet Union, they were trying to hold back the tide of, you know, global kind of prosperity and all that and keep people under the Iron Curtain and eventually it just all snapped and fell apart. So I think it's kind of a similar thing trying to force a CBDC on on the likes of everyone, you know. Would, I, would, would you agree with that, I take it? Yeah, because, because, because of game theory, because America doesn't like China and China doesn't trust uh, Russia and all this, it's like if someone drops the ball, someone's going to pick it up. And that's the beauty of it. And Bitcoin's borderless. You know, it, it 
doesn't follow the conventional rules. The way I see Bitcoin is, you know, I see it loads of ways, digital gold, blah, 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 but it's much deeper than that. But when I'm really thinking about it, I'm like, Bitcoin's a tool. It's a tool that's changed the rules of the reality we used to know. Okay, it's like a building material. We don't yet know what we can build with this thing and how it's gonna change the game, but you can be guaranteed it's gonna change the game of finance. Possibly we rebuild the whole financial world on this thing as a base layer or something. But you know, I'm not smart enough to figure out what we do or how we do it, but I think I'm smart enough to go, well, this thing has innovated and brought so many new things to the table that uh, it's gonna change our world. It's gonna change the game. Yeah, hundred percent. So, like, for people that want to get started with Bitcoin, then, like, where, like, where do you start? Like, yeah, where do you start? Start with podcasts, like the Still Early podcast, like the Bitcoin with Danny podcast. Um, what Bitcoin did, what is money? You know, just try and build an education. If you get into a community uh, of Bitcoiners, either on Telegram or WhatsApp groups. Um, you know, and get around other people who are in the space and learning. Obviously, you know, you can get a wallet and, and buy some Bitcoin. I'd start very small, though, until you understand the tech. It's, I think it's more beneficial to spend more time on, on understanding the technology because to understand Bitcoin, you're going to have to understand money, first of all, which will, uh, which will like blow up your worldview and make you understand. It's like you'll wake up in the matrix and go, oh, no wonder <laughs> none of this is real anymore. Um, a good uh, a good little series just maybe to direct people to something practical is uh, mike malone's series the hidden secrets of money and that's available on, on youtube and that's i think a 10 episode series and it's quite entertaining but it's it's very educational it just teaches people a lot more about money although it's not bitcoin related and he doesn't really get bitcoin he's more gold bug but there's really solid sound uh fundamentals and, and teachings in that series but yeah just getting around bitcoiners getting to Bitcoin meetups uh, and, uh, and obviously, you know, reading some Bitcoin books. What is Bit or um, the Bitcoin standard or uh, the Fiat standard, you know, by Saifedean, they're two pretty awesome books. Although the Bitcoin standard, I read that early in my journey and um, I'm a dyslexic, I struggled through it. I can't say it changed my worldview because I just didn't understand it. I've read it twice more since then, now that I'm further down the rabbit hole, but as an entry, uh, as an entry drug, it's probably a little bit too strong. Well, it was for me anyway. It depends, I suppose, on your sophistication. Um, but but I think the fiat standard was quite easy because that's just teaching about the fiat system. Once you understand what a, a rigged scam that is, <laughs> you're more open to exploring other monetary standards or, or, uh, or systems. It's like you think Bitcoin's complicated until you try to understand how like the existing banking system works. It's like, oh my God, like Bitcoin's so easy compared to it. <laughs> Yeah, the nuts and bolts of Bitcoin is, it, it is quite simple. Like, obviously, you can make it complex, but, but the nuts and bolts of it, 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 it's pretty simple. Yeah, so, okay, so, like, where can we find you, um, Dinny, for people that want to learn learn more about you and what you're doing? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Dinny Collins, or you can find me on social media, Bitcoin with Dinny. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, subscribe to Dinny's podcast. It's great, uh, great interviews all around all this stuff, and... It, Dinny's uh, home environment, home stadium is uh, Facebook, where he goes live to everyone. <laughs> home stadium. <laughs> so, um, didn't even meta alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's not even called Facebook anymore. Uh, yeah. So um, okay, Denny. Look, that's that's great. Uh, thanks very much. I think you're you're gonna have to press end on the podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll finish your podcast. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> thanks, Denny. <laughs>